This episode of Have Guitar, Will Travel is brought to you by Sam Ash Music. Sam Ash Music has been America's favorite family-owned and operated music store chain since 1924. Besides vintage guitars and podcasting gear, Sam Ash has everything for all your music recording and playing needs, for all styles and skill levels. We promise the lowest prices on our wide selection of gear, so whatever you purchase, you know you're getting the best deal out there. Shop with Sam Ash Music online or in-store today. Hi, Vintage Guitar people. Welcome to Have Guitar Will Travel, presented by Vintage Guitar Magazine, with your host, me, James Patrick Regan, otherwise known as Jimmy from the Deadlies. And today I'm speaking with guitarist, collector, and entrepreneur, Sammy Ash. He grew up in his grandparents' store, Sam Ash Music. He started playing guitar at the age of 14, and now he's the COO of Sam Ash Music, and he's a guitar collector. In our conversation, we cover him attending Tommy Emanuel's guitar camp in Nashville. We talk about his family and his siblings' role and their children's role in the company and the start of the Sam Ash Music Store by his grandfather who immigrated from Poland and started the store in 1924 and how Sammy's father met his wife, Sammy's mother, in the store. We talk about how the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show affected the inventory of the store at the time. We talk about the music Sammy was listening to in his youth and meeting the stars he was listening to. Sammy tells us how he helped Paul Reed Smith get started early on. He also tells us about his collection, which is quite spectacular. He talks about the beginning of the vintage guitar market, and Sammy discusses his knowledge of vintage instruments. We talk about the business of running a music store. We talk about the importance of Japanese imports in the lawsuit era and the reason for that. We talk about the NAM show and its importance, and we discuss his relationship with other larger stores like Guitar Center and Sweetwater. We talk about selling Strat Number no. 4 and the sleepers that people should be on the lookout for as far as vintage instruments. We talk about the role online stores like Reverb play in the marketplace. We also talk about the ever-growing strength of the guitar market, which has only increased since COVID. And we don't discuss it in this interview, but he named the Tube Screamer. You can find out more about Sammy on the About page of the store's website. That's samashmusic.com. And he has a presence on Facebook. Please like, comment, and most of all, share this podcast. I'd really appreciate it. And please support Vintage Guitar Magazine and all the wonderful things they do for us guitar players because they do so many wonderful things for us guitar players. Here's Sammy. So how are you, Sammy? Very nice to finally meet you. Absolutely. It's my, the pleasure is all mine. Um, so uh, you are Sammy Ash, I should say. I am Sammy Ash. Uh, my title is COO. I, I do, uh, you know, I'm the guy who builds the stores, all of that kind of stuff. So that's why I've got the COO uh-huh. operations, and head yeah. of customer service, all that kind of stuff. How many, store, how many stores now? Uh, 45. 45. And, uh, and four distribution centers. Wow. Wow, that's crazy. And yeah. That, <laughs> when did when did you so you grew up in the store obviously. When when did you have an official title? How old were you when you had an um, official title? My first official title was sales manager. Uh-huh. Back in 1978, 9, something around that. Uh-huh. Um you know, my this is basically all I do, all I have been doing. Uh-huh. And, and the title's kind of they're good to put on a business card, but in in this company, nobody actually just does their title. Sure, of course. We're all kind of commingled yeah. into, you know, I've got one brother that handles all the back office. He does all the uh, the insurance, the leases, that type of uh, computer systems. Uh-huh. Uh, then I have another brother who does most of the purchasing and... Uh, and sales and things like that. And then I do head of customer service. So if there is a problem, for example, and you can't figure it out at the store, uh-huh. it gets to me, it gets taken care of. Very good. Um, yeah, it's, it's still like going to work. Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. And are you a guitar player? Those are yeah. all yours. <laughs> I'm, I'm a better collector than I am a player. Uh- <laughs> Much better. <laughs> I doubt that. <laughs> uh, you'll You'll see. <laughs> No, you uh, won't actually. Now, when did you start playing guitar? I started noodling around about when I was 14. Uh-huh. Uh, I got my first new guitar, which was a Martin D35 for my 16th birthday. Oh, wow. Right on. That's a and good then uh, I had a, 
a stumble with an accident in 1975 kind of derailed my guitar playing for a while. And I, I've just been a hobbyist. I, you know, I get most of my fe- best licks over the time I was selling. I mean, uh-huh. I was on the floor for years and years. And I, sure. I could you can you play that again? What, <laughs> would you just do that with your pinky? You know, <laughs> so in a sense, I'm self-taught, uh-huh. but I, I pick up stuff for all over the place. Good. Right now, I'm kind of picking up from Marty Schwartz. <laughs> oh, very good. Excellent. That, did you ever play in a band or anything? Or play in bands in high school? No, no. Um, uh, there are about four or maybe five videos of me playing live. I own two of them. I won't be seen. <laughs> another one promised me. <clears throat> another one absolutely promised me it would never be shown. Uh huh. And the other two, you're gonna have a real hard time finding. <laughs> uh, I, I, I've really never played out. When my brother was in bands years ago, I was the roadie. Uh huh. So I was always the support of it. Um, I actually have a bit of a fear of playing with other people because <laughs> you shouldn't. I don't know what it is. I'm I'm doing something in a couple of weeks. I'm going to the uh, um, Tommy Emanuel camp. Oh, really? And right I've never done anything like that in my life. I feel like I'm running away with the circus. Uh huh. Um, right on. Where, so, where where are they holding that? Uh, Nashville. Okay. Which you know I know the town well, so sure. I'm really happy about it. But in i am i'm i'm a what's the word i'm looking for i am my customer that's took place over the past two years i'm the guy that suddenly needed to get a new guitar didn't quite know why Uh and started to want to play better guitar not quite knowing why because before it hit me i was watching people guitar business went insane everyone was anything and then all of a sudden I'm that guy. I found that I'm, I can't explain it. Nobody else can explain it to me, uh-huh. but I, you know, I, I picked up a, a few instruments in this time and uh, I made a, a, a point of, I play guitar an hour a day period. Uh-huh. And I've gotten into bed and gotten out of bed so that I could play my hour of guitar. <laughs> All right, so right. <laughs> I'm, I'm taking it a lot more seriously uh-huh. as clearly the instrument yeah. as opposed to the object. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, if you're if you're going to go to Tommy Emanuel's camp, then clearly you're taking it pretty seriously. I, you know, I I, I thought it was really cool. I I was at both, not as a as a student, but I was at the Joe Satriani and I was at the uh, John Petrucci out here with Dreamcatcher, okay. uh-huh. and we were the dealer, we were the store. And I saw it. Everyone was having an absolute blast. Mm-hmm. But I play finger style. I haven't mm-hmm. used a pick in years and years. Uh-huh. And when I saw this is happening and it's in Nashville and Yorma Kalkinen and all these other fabulous musicians, I just did it. Yeah. I just beelined to it, went in, didn't ask any favors, no nothing, and just bought my ticket, got my hotel reservation, right got my airplane reservation. Yeah. Took an extra day so I can have a little bit of fun, uh, yeah. you know, side fun, because I have a lot of friends in town. I'll bet. So I'll bet. Yeah. I'm looking for. I really. I, I'm. I'm nervous as all hell doing this. But, uh, <laughs> Don't be nervous. It'll be fun. You're there to learn. You can't be nervous. <laughs> the and so your siblings. How many brothers and sisters do you have? Two brothers. Two brothers. Uh, I'm the youngest of the three. Uh huh. Um. My brother David, like I said, he is all the, the serious stuff. Uh-huh. The, the he's he's the guy that helps make the organization run. Uh-huh. Nothing fun, you know. Like, I saved a lot of money on insurance. You know, that's what he does. Sure, that's sure. his thing. Yep. Um, I'm more out front. Uh, Richard deals with the manufacturers, uh-huh. so I'm I'm the youngest at sixty three. So we're all, and I'm also the youngest of anybody that is running the company. I'm the youngest bef- before the head of purchasing, the head of co- uh, dealer, all of that. Oh, okay. And so we now have a nice younger crew uh-huh. that's going to take it to the next level. I have two boys in the business. You met Ben. Sure. Uh, my brother Richard has three boys in the business. Oh, wow. And they're all pretty much committed to uh, this is what we want to do. We want to take it to the next level. Yeah. And they're all smart enough to be able to do it. They're frankly, between all of them, they're a lot smarter than we are. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I'm, I'm 
pretty comfortable. Yeah. And now what's going to happen. And you guys are based in New York. You, you personally are based in New York. The, uh, everybody is here. Okay. Uh, the company is headquartered on long Island. Okay. And, um, you know, my, my father lives here. My brother lives here. I live here. My sons, well, one son, and I have a brother, my oldest brother, David, commutes between Manhattan and Long Island. Okay. But, you know, everybody is essentially within a 20-mile radius of each oh, wow. other. Wow. That's, that's, that's fantastic. Absolutely. Well, it's easy on holidays. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and the, the company was started by your grandparents? My grandfather started in 1924. Uh-huh. And as the true story goes, my grandmother pawned her engagement ring oh, wow. and used the money for a down payment on the building. Uh-huh. And wow. My grandfather was known to be an honest guy. Uh-huh. And so when he asked for credit on certain instruments to be able to, the, to populate the store, he was given it. And the next thing you know is they're running a very, very small little store, uh-huh. uh, like 12 hours, 14 hours a day, living upstairs. It's the, it's the real immigrant story. Sure. From, it's a true from nothing story. And, and, where, and where did they, they immigrate from? Uh, my grandfather came from Poland. My grandmother came from, I guess, what was the Ukraine. Okay. And they met here. Uh-huh. And, wow. uh huh. And, and my father and mother met in the music store. It, oh, wow. it's, it's really that. It's really that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, um, this woman who wanted to date my father brought my mother with her to ask her about him. <laughs> and uh, my mother fell in love with her. Him. Uh-huh. My father started going out with her. And it all started because my mother leaned like this and broke a couple records. <laughs> and my father was first furious. So it's just, it's really, you know, it, uh, I, I, I really appreciate the history that my family has. Sure. And initially uh, in 1924, were they selling mostly violins and mandolins and that kind of stuff? Uh, basically, that was what it was. Um, lots of sheet music, lots of records. Uh, for a while, we were 50%... Uh, they wouldn't call phonographs yet. Uh, uh-huh. Victrolas. Uh-huh. You know, the pla- the resin, the tubes, things sure, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as radio got bigger, suddenly he's got these big monstrosities that no one's buying. So they started going more into orchestral because uh-huh. that is really what my grandfather knew. He was in a bunch of different bands, uh-huh. the Sam Ash Club Society Orchestra and a few others. And, uh, you know, he would ask his drummer, what drums should I carry? And he'd ask yeah. his saxophone player, you know, what's a good horn line I should do? Yeah. And he, that's basically how they cobbled this, this little company together. That's fantastic. And, and when did the transition, was it when the Beatles went on Ed Sullivan? Was that the transition where guitars were, became more of the focus and drums and all that? The transition came around 1960 when we first opened up on Long Island. Okay. So um, when the Beatles hit, yes, we had to completely refigure out our inventory. But when the Beatles hit, we had really strong presence on Long Island. Uh-huh. Big, uh, big, comp- big store out there. And then all of a sudden, you know, the amplifier department that was up on the shelf now has to come back on the floor and, you know, saxophones have to go back and back there because we need more of this for Gretsch. We need more of this for Gibson. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, that, and in the sixties, it completely changed what is, what a music store looked like. Uh-huh. It, 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 they were, we were big in orchestral and band instruments. And when you walked into the store, that was 50% of our, our inventory. Uh-huh. And now, then it, went down to the point where it's about uh, eight. So <laughs> wow. <laughs> huge mindset change with oh, the yeah. Beatles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, and did you guys have a presence in the city um, at that point? We didn't get to Manhattan until 1970. Okay. So the Beatles had already hit, Hendrix had already hit, and they uh-huh. all went to Manny's. Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, there was no reason to go to Long Island except when they built Nassau Coliseum. Uh, all of a sudden, B- 
big acts started to sh- you know hit Long Island, you were getting Zeppelin and you were getting Yes and all these other bands that would never come to Long Island before, and they all had roadies. Yeah, we yeah. were the only place on Long Island to go to that had a decent inventory. Oh wow! You know, if you were in Manhattan, you went to Manny's. Sure. Um, and I I, w- I I was a fan of the store. Yeah, I, I was a big Manny's fan. Uh-huh. We ended up buying them for the last 15 years. We loved it so much. It just wow. didn't work out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's great. That's uh, that's a legacy there also. Oh, yeah. That's, <laughs> and, that and, was, uh, uh, was a dream. When you were young, did you have the op- – were you listening to rock music in, in general? Or were you what were you listening oh, to? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, my mother ran the sheet music department. Uh-huh. So everything was top 40. So mm-hmm. she was always had the AM rock and roll stations on all the time uh-huh. and when you drove with my father it was classical or jazz uh-huh. except on sundays it was latin so <laughs> right. i had i was getting all this stuff coming from all sides uh-huh. and then my brother richard uh who took on the the guitar very early on brought me in with hendrix and jeff beck and Yardbirds and all of that stuff when i was very young uh-huh. So that kind of set my pattern as to what I wanted to listen to. I never really got too much into pop bands. Uh-huh. If you had a strong lead guitar player and you were in the 60s and the 70s, I sought you out. Uh-huh. I, I was really into what the musicianship was growing into. And, you know, there are still guitar players that just blow my mind today. Yeah. The, uh, did you have an opportunity when you were young to to meet some of the people you were listening to? Oh, yeah. I met Jeff Beck when I was 14. Wow. Uh, I met him in, out in Los Angeles. I was on a teen tour. Uh-huh. And it was the craziest thing. But, yeah, through the years, Steve Vai and Satriani. But back then, um, Alvin Lee uh-huh. was renting a house on Long Island. So I saw him a number of times. Uh-huh. Um Fantastic guitar player. Bro. What's his name from the Stones? Uh, Mick Taylor. Mick Taylor was living on Long Island. He gave, he became a you know a good customer, and uh, Richie Blackmore would walk into my Huntington store, which I wasn't walking into, uh-huh. but his roadie would come into my store uh, <laughs> because we had a relationship. And he you know real funny little thing. I used to send Japanese. Stratocaster copies to Richie Blackmore around the around the world actually uh-huh. for his when he was breaking guitars because it was way too expensive to break Stratocasters. Sure, so I was sure, selling sure. Color Rebelli white on white on white Stratocasters all over the world so he could break them this continent and he could break them on that continent. It's fun. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> and uh, back then, I remember seeing like uh, Herb Ellis. In doing like uh, in store uh, lessons, did you guys ever do stuff like that back in the? Oh back in yeah, the- we we did a lot of less, uh, not not lessons. Excuse me, we did a lot of in store events. We did a lot of events in in areas next to us. Uh-huh. Um, we've had Buddy Rich. We did a lot of drummer ones. Uh-huh. Buddy Rich, Billy Cobham, uh, uh, Joe Morello, Vinnie Caliuta. Oh yeah, I. Oh. I, I drummers we did a lot of uh-huh. guitar players not as many they for some reason it, it drum drummers when you're in a rock band drummers want to show you i'm just not just a rock drummer sure so they love doing these things because you see wow they really are a rounded musician yeah they don't just do this all day long yeah and yeah. there were a lot of instances like that and uh you know i learned to respect musicians a little bit more as opposed to just making a snap decision on what they were or what they were about sure sure what what kind of guitars were you interested in when you were first when you first started playing was there any special brand or any any special model yeah I, you know we had a really good relationship with gibson uh-huh. when i was a kid uh-huh. and um i you know i i just always found myself uh I did more special runs with Gibson. Uh, I was down at the factory a number of times, uh-huh. pre and post Henry. Uh-huh. I was actually, I, I remember, I was very young, but I remember going to the Kalamazoo factory. Uh-huh. And I was, my brother and I were just at that age where I saw a whole lot of brown cases as a bunch of dirty boxes. 
and he saw a whole bunch of brown cases and oh shit that's all 50s yeah you know we just just were i wasn't there yet i couldn't appreciate sure. what was happening in kalamazoo yeah uh shame but um <laughs> yeah uh from very early on i've you know i've been really a very much a gibson guy uh-huh. i was very early adopter of prs yeah uh, we we actually helped paul out starting his company oh great um that's that's yeah when he was he needed to get po's to go to the bank he it's in his book he needed to make get po's to go to the bank to get his loan to start the factory up he had the building but he didn't have the, the wherewithal of yeah. the good he had the wherewithal excuse me yeah. he didn't have the goods to do it yeah and our po was the biggest one that he brought back to the bank wow uh, equal to everybody else's and yeah so and paul and i became very good friends at that point uh-huh. and that's why uh, that guy over there is prs number four. Oh, right on right yeah on. I, i've got a lot of early prs's so yeah um yeah I, i'm a humbucking guy <laughs> right on the uh and and your collection right now what is it how much how many how many pieces in your collection would you say about 175 wow. about 155 are guitars the rest are uh, a couple amplifiers uh-huh. uh, a few instruments my uncle left me when he passed away okay uh, but you know i've got them all cataloged photographed sure. in every which way uh, they're all insured. So, uh, yeah, I, I, that was another thing I wasn't taking seriously. At one time, I just had a bunch of guitars. Uh-huh. And, okay, what do we have? What do I have? Wow, you know, the value on this and the value on that really should take this a little bit more seriously. Yeah, yes. And I did. And now I can actually call it a collection because I can call up any instrument I have. I have the dates, the serial numbers, all of that laid out. Yeah. So, you know, I, I could pull up any one of these instruments and, and figure it out. And Yeah, I, I, that's another thing. I'm the head of uh, used for the company. Oh, okay. So I, I get a kind of a lead on the cool stuff that hits first. So. Yeah, <laughs> that's not fair. <laughs> I, I really don't take advantage of it. It's, it's maybe once, twice a year, I might pull something for myself, but that's about it. I want the good stuff for my customers. Oh yeah, of course. That's how you get customers. When did you see the the market turning towards towards vintage instruments? At some point, was there was there a uh, was there a point, or has it just happened so slowly over the years that we went from from old Les Pauls to vintage Les Pauls? Um. You know, Richie Friedman at We Buy is a good friend, uh-huh. and his father started that business. So to me, it was kind of like always there because they were on 48th Street since the 60s. Yep. And they only had, back then, old Gibsons were what we call vintage Gibsons. Sure. Because back in the 60s, yeah. everything was 50s. Yeah. So, um, you know, at the, that market was always. Uh, around to me, but I, I have to give credit to George Gruen for the first time I actually saw a vintage store set up that way. Yeah. He wasn't carrying new gear. And this is at the long, long, long time ago at the old building in Nashville. Sure, on, and on Broadway. And I, I got the concept, oh, wow, there is this business just based on vintage instruments. Yeah. Now, we're good in vintage, we're big on used. Uh-huh. You know, I'll I'll buy every vintage piece I, I can get my hands on. But I don't go out and I don't go to shows and okay. buy them. I don't stock up. It's not our meat. It's not our forte. Sure. But what we buy is very good. And, you know, I people try to sell me vintage instruments with, with broken headstocks. Yeah, but it's from 1955. Yeah. I, I don't care. It's got a broken headstock. Yeah. That's all that matters to me. Yeah. So, um yeah, it's, it's actually, it's a bit of a hobby as well, uh-huh. you know, learning about my instruments. I have a pretty extensive knowledge of the guitar. Yeah. And, and speaking of broken headstocks, do you, uh, is, do you guys have repair shops in your stores? Most stores Okay. have a really qualified uh, in-house guitar tech. One or two stores are a little shorthanded, so they share somebody, uh-huh. but... For the most part, my guys, you know, a lot of my repair techs have been around with decades. Uh 
really good stuff. They have their followings. I have some techs where customers who don't buy from me will go to my tech. Oh, good. Yeah. Which that's, is fine. Hey, I, that's great. Oh, yeah, Whatever gets you in my store, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, of course. And, and, you know, being a guitar guy, I want to know, would I bring my guitar to my tech? Yeah. That, you know, that's one of the things. I, every once in a while, I want to see what somebody's work is like. Yeah. We, we, we had a... Uh, a lesser tech not that far ago that really did a, a hatchet job on one of my customers' instruments. I had to replace the instrument. Oh, wow. You know, and I explained to the manager, I said, you know, would you let this guy work on your guitar? Because I wouldn't let him work on mine. Yeah. How can you let him work on our customers? A change was made. Yeah. Very good. Very good. And and you're, you, so you mentioned that you're, you have a good, a good knowledge of vintage instruments. Are you the, the type of person that can tell, oh, this screw right here is from 1957 on this? <laughs> or are you, uh... Uh, not that kind of detail, but I can pretty much tell you what it is from a distance, uh -huh. years, and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, you know, I'm fairly good on serial numbers. I'm... Uh, fairly good on pot codes things like that i can i can open up a guitar know what i'm looking at right whether it's real or not uh -huh. and whether it's even even if it's period correct but not to that instrument sure I, i've gotten my knowledge has gotten pretty good i i never thought that you know this this used and vintage business that we're in uh -huh. not you know we do a lot of used and vintage in brass and winds uh-huh if you would have told me 10 years ago that I can tell you from a serial number what that Selmer Mark VI year was made, was, I, I wouldn't have believed it. <laughs> and, and, you know, you get this education. Somebody brings in something to sell. I don't know much about it. Uh -huh. I want to learn about it. Yeah. You know, early on, I learned where various Japanese guitar factories, you know, where guitars were made by the factory serial number codes. All of those kind of things that we take for granted now that everybody knows. You click on the internet. Oh, yeah. Oh, that one? That's made in Fuji Ken. Okay. Yeah. Well, back then, you had to learn that stuff. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> back in the in the day, in the 60s and the 70s, were you guys selling Japanese instruments? You know, copy, what we consider copies now? Yes. Oh, we yeah. We carried a lot of lawsuits. Oh, good. As a matter of fact, we imported a lot of lawsuits. Um <laughs> We, uh, my family is very good friends with the Hoshino family. Okay. And um, they, we got involved with them way, way early on. Um, my father and uh, Joe Hiroshi Hoshino, uh, they, they were making a lot of instruments and not bringing so much in under their name. So we yeah. were bringing in Les Pauls and 175s, 335s, and all these other copy instruments that were, decent quality oh sure they were really good quality yeah because at the time there was no distributor we were buying them from japan uh -huh. and selling them and then when they opened up headquarters in, in uh, philadelphia we actually became a bigger customer because they now brought on tama uh -huh. so uh, you know I, I remember esp when they were on 48th street on the third floor um Above one of was it above my store? Above the recording studio, you know, Steve, um, Steve Kaufman and ESP when they got started, Forty Eighth Street Custom. Wow. I remember uh, the Phil LeBeau uh, guitars. Uh huh. Oh yeah. Were built on Forty Eighth Street. You know, was it John Soar. Was it Charles LeBeau? Soar, Pence's Soar, John Soar, who came from Forty Eighth Street. Sure. I mean, there's a there's a a lot of New York vibe in what I do. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yes. The, and any of those pieces, the the copy pieces, do you have any of those in your collection? Yeah, I, I've got um, I've got three Stratocasters, a jazz bass, Guild acoustic copy uh -huh. under the Angelica name that was ours. Carlo Rebelli was ours. Oh wow! Yeah, well, I've got a, a lot of mini, what we called minis, mini Strats, Les Pauls, Flying V's, but the Japanese ones that yeah. we were importing called Sammy. Oh wow! <laughs> so I have a little collection of those things, you know, uh, I, I have a little collection of stuff over the years, Sure. you know, original Sam Ash fuzz boxes, and, you know, stuff that I've collected that one day maybe I'll have some kind of a little museum, old Sam Ash amplifiers, oh, right PA on. cabinets. <laughs> my father and my uncle were very uh, ambitious in what they did. Sure. And put us on the map they were very creative people they yeah. got us into 
the importing business and the private label and all of that, which was at the time great. I mean, I couldn't get a decent instrument from my American companies at a decent price. Oh, yeah. And a lot of, you know, in those years, they also, a lot of them weren't making great product. Yeah. Yes. did what you had to do for, for like the nam show you're on both sides of your purchaser and your uh, and you have products there um yes and no i'm not allowed at my booth <laughs> they do their thing and they do their thing very very well uh-huh. and though i'm a very big customer of ours they prefer me not to be there uh-huh. besides i do my business with them every day anyway sure. they're next door <laughs> yeah. uh, how important is the nam show do you think to to you and your business in past years it was ridiculously important do you want we you know we had products that we had to introduce and the nam show the winter nam show was always very big for us sure um and as a dealer i i used to go as the bo- one of the buyers one sure. of the main buyers yeah um now i go more to find new product uh-huh. see old friends that kind of stuff so the the concept of nam has changed for me yeah uh, do i think it's an important show yes i do uh-huh. i really think that this industry should periodically get together oh yeah and and do this kind of show absolutely the, and and did your did your feeling about nam change after covid did when uh, did your well i should start by saying did your sales spike during covid and do you feel the same way about nam after covid even if without the show going on uh i do feel the same but with covid covid was very scary because yes our mail order business shot up it went insane yeah but the stores were closed yeah yeah we, we for two and a half months i had 45 stores closed i wow. had a, close to a thousand people on furlough oh, my it was God. scary yeah you know guitar center same thing their p their mail order business spiked but their stores had to suffer uh so we're not suffering anymore yeah. and business is very healthy and we are still selling every single guitar we can get our hands on did the mail order stay at a, a, a spiked level no because a lot of our mail order customers are our store customers uh-huh. so when they couldn't get to our stores they went up yeah. but the other thing about what covid was is that it became a free-for-all you you really didn't have a loyal customer anymore yeah. if if you're a Sweetwater guy and Sam Ash had that Les Paul in that color, I'm buying it from Sam Ash. And in, in the reverse, suddenly it was, you got it, I'll buy it. Uh-huh. And, and that, you know, at every price point, beginner yeah. instruments, I, I don't have any high-end guitars. I mean, you know, like my super high-end stuff. I am wiped out. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I can't, I can't promise when stuff is coming in. Stuff sure. is constantly coming in, but... Yeah. Not like it used to. Yep. And do you have a relationship with Guitar Center and Sweetwater? Do you guys like, you know, or is it is it adversarial or do you do you guys are you uh, friends? I used to have a great relationship with Guitar Center back when uh Marty and uh and um Larry ran the place. Larry and I were actually friends. We still are friends. Uh-huh. Uh Sweetwater, um tremendous amount of respect for for Chuck. I've met Chuck on several occasions. And uh, very nice guy, clearly one of the smartest guys in this business. Uh There's no question about that. Um, So, yeah, uh, I don't really see a reason to be adversarial. Uh I've got too much to worry about than worrying about what somebody else is worrying about me. (laughs) There's just so much you can can do. My competition is going to do what my competition is going to do. Sure. I'm not going to be able to change it or alter it. And the same thing for me. I've got to run our company the way we feel is best. Uh-huh. And if I'm taking time out of running our company to go after somebody, but not that I could go after Guitar Center, look at the size of them, yeah, yeah. but it's futile. Yes, It's a waste of time and effort. Yeah. It's a t- we're a very, very small industry. I'd rather have a whole lot of friends. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If, if you don't mind me asking, what's the, what's the most expensive guitar you've ever sold as far as a vintage guitar? Can you say? We had a 19... 19- we had Strat number four. Oh wow! And uh, we sold that. Also, actually, we sold that. I think to Richie Friedman. Okay. And I'd rather not give you the price, but you know, it was Strat number four. Wow. Leave it at that. Yeah, yeah, of course. It wasn't cheap. 
It was a uh, rep sample. It uh-huh. didn't say number four on the plate. It said number four on the plastic. Oh, wow. And apparently we checked, we, we tracked down uh, one of the original reps, Jody Carver, and we told him what we have, what we think it is. And he said, without actually handing it in my hands, yes, that's what you have. You have one of the first rep samples that ever came out. It was very cool. Yeah, that's great. That's fantastic. Any, any other uh, guitars stick out uh, that have come, you know, come through the store? Um, the good stuff doesn't really sit. I mean, to, <laughs> I can think of an awful lot of great instruments we've had over the years. But right now, my, I, you know, you want a really great vintage instrument for me? It's, I, I don't have a lot. Uh-huh. I have a lot of really great instruments. Yeah. But the pickings for me, at least, are very slim. Uh-huh. See, we don't do consignment. Yeah. We own our inventory. If we did consignment, I'd have a lot more to choose from. Sure, sure. But I, I get a little nervous holding on to somebody else's baby. You Absolutely. Know? I can understand. So I, I, that's a little difficult for me. Uh-huh. We're looking at it, but like I said, a little difficult for me. Yeah, yep. Are, is there instruments that that you think are sleepers that people should be keeping their eyes out on for? As yeah, far- I always think Guild. <laughs> yeah. Guild is a sleeper. I mean... I can't believe how cheap some of the uh, old um, uh, Rhode Island stuff is. You know, uh, here. This is this is my uh, my artist award. Oh wow! All right, this is as nice as any L five I have ever played uh-huh. at almost half the price. Wow! Still stunning. It's still gorgeous, but they just don't bring the money. Uh-huh. And they are great instruments. You know, I'm not taking anything away from the USA manufactured stuff. I think they make great stuff. But the original um, Westerly stuff, and even some of the old Hoboken stuff, is just not getting what they should be getting. And I'm not quite sure why. Maybe they've gone up in value, but, you know... If I have uh, an old D55 and I try to ask more than $3,000 for it, I won't get it. Wow. <laughs> and, and it's it's clearly worth a lot more, but uh-huh. you know, hopefully that stigma will rise. Yeah. But yeah, I, I definitely, if I had to pick a brand, that's the most undervalued brand out there. Uh-huh. And how about ampl- amplifiers? We, right now, it seems like Fender amplifiers are just going through the old Fender amplifiers are going through the roof. Is there another amplifier? Another amplifier company you think is undervalued? We, um, well, I, I just you know I, we bought a '66 Super Reverb. Uh-huh. Trying to remember what it was, and you know the salesman bought it not knowing what he bought from a guy not knowing what he had. Yeah. We we paid for a Fender amplifier, uh-huh. and then when I looked up what it was worth, it was. 2700 bucks or something like that uh-huh. you know um people are catching up you sure. know you want that old fender sound you oh, buy an old fender yeah yep <laughs> for sure how how when you guys are buying it used instruments how do you set up how do you figure out what the value of it is so you have you know what things are selling for but is there uh oh. do you guys do you go through your records like oh we sold this one for this much and how do you come um, up with that price all the high-end instruments have to go through me. Uh-huh. If we're purchasing an instrument that's above fifteen hundred dollars, it has to be cleared through me. Wow! So I have a direct, in, you know, input as to what we're going to pay and what we're going to sell it for. Uh-huh. And in some cases, I have to do a little bit of research to figure out what the market is. Uh-huh. But you know, certain customers come in; they know what they want to get for it. If I can give it to them, they're happy. Uh-huh. They know they can get more, but they want to get rid of it. Yeah, and that's way more often than you might think. Okay. You know, I just, I, I'm done with this. Love the guitar. I'm done with it. How much are you going to give me for it? Yeah. I'll give you this. Okay, take it. And we try to mark these things under market value so that uh-huh. we get looked at first. Yeah. You know, I've got thousands of instruments on reverb. Yeah. Okay. You know, so, you know, we have a, a very, we're very protective of our reputation. And we don't want to be seen as anything but solid, and, you know. If if the salesman buys something, it's a mistake, and we found out that it did have a crack in the neck or it did have a crack in the top. We reduce the price, or we take it off of for sale. Uh huh. And, and do you think reverb is uh, is is reverb a valuable marketplace for you guys? Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Very smart people too. Um, 
uh, for, from the retailer's perspective, yes. Uh -huh. I can't, I won't give you a number, but it would blow your mind how much I sell a month on Reverb. Wow. It's basically Reverb is my 46th store. Well, okay. Except it does more business than most of my stores. <laughs> it's a big resource for everybody. Um, you, you get, look at the inventory. You, you want to, you know, you put in exactly what you want and you'll find it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Put in the, yeah. I want a 1962, blah, 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 blah. And somebody's got one. Yeah. You may not want to pay for it, but they've got one. It, yeah. It's an awesome resource. It's also a good resource for me when I'm trying to price things out. What are, what a market, what's market going for? Yeah. Sure. So, yeah, it, it it's, it's really becoming a big international. Salesforce. Yeah, marketplace. Sure. Marketplace, better word. Much yeah. better word. The and and are you selling more vintage instruments on reverb than you are through your own online presence? Your Not own? no, actually. Most of the vintage instruments we sell are over the counter. Customers okay. come in. Okay. But it's it's the used instruments. Mm -hmm. The just for back lack of just used instruments. That's crazy on reverb. And okay. you find weird stuff in our stores. You'd be, you know, you find an old tailpiece, you put up the old tailpiece, somebody's going to buy it. Yeah. Yeah. It's even hard to describe what the tailpiece is, but somebody sees it. Oh, I'll take that. I need that. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I really think Re Reverb is a great place to, you know, you don't want to buy it. You don't want to sell it to me. Sell it to there. Yeah. Is, and is there a store, does your Long Island store have uh, a, a bo boxes and boxes of old pieces and parts? Um, we have a lot of the Island stores. Some of them migrated to the Manhattan store, Okay. but what's really been fun is we bought out a few older music stores in the past few years. So I have a couple buckets of tubes oh. <laughs> and drawers full of knobs and screws and all kinds of stuff. Uh -huh. uh, a lot of old vintage you know, one of my guys will say, I've got this, but it's missing this part. I go, what's the part? I go, buy the guitar. I've got the part. Yeah. Right on. So that's been, it's a lot of fun. What a lot of these dealers, yeah, I, I got, uh, where did you go? I got this. I got this when I buying out. You ever hear of Michael's music in Long Island? Uh, I'm, I'm not from the East Coast, so no, I haven't heard of it. <laughs> okay. So he was a big guitar guy. A uh, pretty good guitar player in his day. Uh -huh. And we bought him out lock, stock, and barrel from the family. And this was amongst the stuff that was 1953, relatively perfect. Uh, EBO. Uh, yo, no, actually, this is an EB1. Okay. And uh, 1953. And it was kind of like sitting there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And that tuners on that? What kind of tuners are those? I, those I, are banjo pegs. Yeah, banjo peg tuners. I've never the old seen banjo. That That's great. Uh, yeah. And and are you guys still actively look, you know, looking for mom and pop music stores that want to get out of the business? Uh, we're not actively looking. We we a lot of stuff falls in our lap. Uh -huh. A lot of these dealers who went under, we were contacted. We have a very good reputation. Sure. You know, try to it. it when the store owner dies, it's not a good time to take advantage oh, of no, people. Oh, no, of course not. And uh, it's never a good time, but I'm just saying it's like really disgusting if you do that. Yeah. So yeah. we have this reputation where we will go to the store, we will catalog everything. If you like our prices, great. If you don't, at least now you have a valuation. Uh -huh. Wow. Yeah. That's great. Even a small music store has a couple thousand things when you really pull out the the drawers and the bins and oh, the yeah. stuff behind the stuff. and <laughs> Yes, for sure. How many employees now are you guys at? Uh, Do you know? <laughs> yeah, over over 700. Wow, that's great. It was, it was a lot bigger. Yeah. After COVID, the traffic went down. Uh -huh. We just couldn't have the amount of people that we that was, were coming in. Yeah. So the most of the people that are with us have been with us a long time. My managers, sales managers, they were there through it all. You know, when after two and a half months of clothing closing, most of my people came back. Uh -huh. About ninety-five percent of everybody came back. Wow, that's great. 
So uh, that was great. That that made us feel good that they had that kind of confidence in the business. Sure. Because, you know, we we didn't take that advantage of just saying, hey, you know, we could reduce payroll by getting all these new people. No, I want my people. I want them back. I want them to be happy. They've helped build this company. Yeah. Yep. And and are there any trends you see? Like, I have no (laughs) I don't know anything for sure, but I've heard that the guitar sales are actually picking up like new guitar sales for new customers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When, When when. You know, when COVID hit, the tide rose all boats. Uh I mean, the high end, yes, there's no question about it. Vintage people gobbling it up. But I I don't have a Strat pack. Uh I don't have many Squire Strats right now. I don't have many Epiphones right now. They're big. I mean, people, it's not just the people who had the instruments who got more instruments. Yet there's a huge influx of people coming back as beginners. Uh You know, we we always had that fight with the video game, but a lot of the kids now who have the video game seem to have a guitar as well. Sure. You know, also, if you take a look at TV commercials, guitar has become very... you if you have a guitar in the background, you're cool in the commercial. Sure. I don't... They You see that? Yeah. They always have it. And uh, these days when you do a lot of... Um, I notice on MSNBC or CNN or whatever, and they... Do a podcast with somebody at the house. There's always a guitar stuck. Right? Sure. Very, you know, obvious right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I live in a 20,000 square foot. But my guitar is right there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, there's a lot. There's a lot coming through. Uh-huh. I'm, I, I'm excited for the future. Do you see DJ gear still selling? As, like it, it seemed to be very popular in the 90s and the early 2000s. Is that, is that still very big? It, okay. Still very big, but. Not as much of the big stuff. Uh-huh. We're selling a lot more towards the desktop these days. Okay. You know, not unlike, um, what was that movie? Uh, Anna Kendricks, and she's at college, and she's got this small little uh, studio. She's sitting on her bed. That's really huge. That's become a very big business. Okay. People who are doing their own production on, you know, samples or their own instruments. Uh-huh. Uh, the business, that part of the business is still very strong. Okay. But we, you know, I haven't seen a guitar market like this. And I haven't seen a guitar market like this. Even with the Beatles, you know, you had a lot of people who wanted to play guitar because they wanted to be musicians. Now you just got a lot of people just want to play guitar, Uh period. I like to play guitar. I have 150, 300, 500, 700 bucks. I think it's kind of cool planning a trip. It's, It's big. It's big. Acoustic guitars also. Uh-huh. Right now, yeah, yeah. That, and th- back to your collection, the highlights of your collection. Do you are do you, I see a blackguard back there? Is that a, a older blackguard? No, it's not. It's but it is one of the very first fifty-two reissues. Okay, serial number zero one four eight. Okay, <laughs> that's the whole serial number. Um, well, the guy in the middle is a, a fifty-five gold top. Okay. Um, it's got 56 appointments because it's November 55. Uh-huh. That's a, a 55 junior. That's a 59 junior. Uh-huh. Like I said, Paul Reed Smith, number four, number six. Yeah. Uh, 63 Strat. Um, custom shop, Telly. Uh-huh. You know, I got my Martins. Yeah. I got Martins over there and I got other stuff over here. And uh-huh. most of, but most of my stuff is at the office, you know, uh-huh. where a lot of the stuff is held. I've got a pretty fairly large ovation collection. Oh, do you really? I've got about uh, 40 ovations. Wow. 35 of them are serial number four. Wow. Uh, I got a lot of number four things. It, uh-huh. It's something I, well, I think it might have started when I got Paul Reed Smith number four. Uh-huh. And then, uh, but I, I've got a lot of instruments with serial numbers, number fours. <laughs> I have effects pedals that people have given me. Okay. Uh, I have Tube Screamer, the, the reissue number four, and I've got uh, several Eddie Van Halen, a lot of, you know, yeah. it, it's somehow it just became my thing. Yep. Yep. Is there any instruments that you're seeking out for your collection that you're, that you're like any particular instrument, I should say? Not at this time. Um, I, I have most of, you know, I, what I want. Uh-huh. I've got my Guild 12 string. I've got, you know, the classic stuff. Yeah. 
the stuff that, you know, that you would have and, you know, my, I've got a great 335, I've got a gazillion Les Pauls and Stratocasters. Sure. You know, I, I, I play a, the instrument according to the mood and very often the instrument sets my mood. Uh-huh. I don't play it. I don't know why. I don't really play a Strat the same way I play a Les Paul. Oh, I never yeah. understand that, but I've noticed it. Uh-huh. Um, the, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Lucky, I guess. Yeah. I, 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 you know, this, this has been, it's been with me my whole life. I didn't realize it was a passion until much later. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, I'm, I'm bitten. Yeah. I'm totally bitten. Yeah. I'm in well, you're now, in a good so. place to be bitten. <laughs> yeah, and I, I've got my, you, my Ben, who you met, uh-huh. kind of, he's got his little bit of a collection. He's got a big effects collection. He's a pedal guy. Okay. Not really a pedal guy. Uh-huh. Not really that much of an amp guy, too. My perfect mental setup is a Les Paul, Tube Screamer, Wawa, Marshall, JCM 800, the 1968. Uh-huh. That, <laughs> to me, is all you really need. Sure. As, but, you know. as, um, and in your amp collection, is, is that what you have, Marshalls? I, I don't. I have a Marshall uh, 4100, the 100 watt JCM combo. Uh-huh. Uh, I, oh, what do I? Yo, I have uh, a class five in white, serial number four. Wow. Um, uh, I got a really nice um, Vox AC, British AC 30 in oh. fawn. Wow. Uh, it's it's like the guitars i have my tones represented uh-huh. i've got my fender tone i've got my supro i've got my marshall and vox so all what i'm trying to hear i can basically just literally plug into sure um but you know i have a what, maybe 10 amps maybe uh, okay so like i said i'm not an amp guy i'm a guitar guy yeah and do you ever sell anything out of your collection only recently uh-huh. Uh, when I started doing my my rider for insurance, and I'm looking at certain instruments, and I'm saying, you know, I could buy two other guitars with that money that of an instrument that I just they, for a while I bought a few instruments to buy them. Yeah, they didn't yeah. they didn't have a purpose to me. Most of these instruments have a purpose. I have them for a reason for a vibe or for when they were built or how they were built or uh-huh. if I'm involved in them somehow. Yeah. And I had a bunch of these other instruments. So um, last year I sold about six guitars, okay. which I haven't done in decades. And I used that money for various things and a few guitars. Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, apart from the, gu- the guitar and the, and the stores and everything, what do you do to, to you know, get away from it? What, what do you do for fun? I don't get away from it. (laughs) Okay. It's, you know, it's uh, what I do. The business is open uh, 16 hours between New York and L.A. Okay. A lot of things that I I, kind of like work when I get home and I work when I'm at work. And so, you know, I shut down and play a little guitar. Uh Uh-huh. And clears the head out a bit. Yeah. But no, I I don't have a lot of hobbies. I mean, I kind of, this you know, this kind of stuff. <laughs> I've got four sons. I've got one that still lives with me. I've uh-huh. got a you know, I have a full time job with life. Ah, very good. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, Same I, here, man. I really appreciate you doing this and oh, asking no. me. It's it's uh, this is an honor for me, and uh, and I hope that I get the opportunity to meet you in person. Well, if it's waiting for an AM show, it won't be till June. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but hopefully, sometime before then. Yeah, absolutely. I got to make. It I up. really appreciate this, man. Thank no, you very no. much. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Have a great day. You too. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to Have Guitar Will Travel. You can catch up on all the things I'm doing at thedeadlies.com. And I'm on all the social media platforms as well. And please support Vintage Guitar and all the wonderful things they do because they do many, many wonderful things for us guitar players. Thanks. Please subscribe. Please tell a friend. And I'll see you guys next week. Bye, guys.
This episode of Have Guitar Will Travel is brought to you by Sam Ash Music. Sam Ash Music has been America's favorite family owned and operated music store chain since 1924. Besides vintage guitars and podcasting gear, Sam Ash has everything for all your music recording and playing needs, for all styles and skill levels. We promise the lowest prices on our wide selection of gear, so whatever you purchase, you know you're getting the best deal out there. Shop with Sam Ash Music online or in store today.